In 1925, Pope Pius XI, you remember him, right? <laughs> Pope Pius XI set apart a day for Christ the King, and he created this Sunday called Christ the King. He was living at a time where he thought the world was turning more and more secular and wanted to bring people back to focus on Christ, to see Christ as the Lord, Christ as the King over all. And so he decided to create a Sunday called Christ the King. But he also planted it on a Sunday that was going to make Lutherans a little upset. He did it on the Sunday before All Saints, which for us is Reformation. That's right. So not only is he pointing toward Christ as the king, he's trying to force Lutherans to get rid of the Reformation to focus on Christ. Ah, crafty, pious guy, right? <laughs> well, anyway, around Vatican II, after the Vatican II, they started to come up with a three-year lectionary cycle, and they decided to move Christ the king to a better spot right before Advent, because Christ the king talks about the coming of Christ, the Messiah that's to come, the, the afterlife, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, end time type of language. But that's also what Advent talks about as well. And so they're bookending the year. This is the last Sunday in our church year. Next Sunday when you come for, for Advent, it'll be the first Sunday in our church year. And so it's bookended with stories about the coming of the King, the coming of the second coming of Christ. And in Advent, it's also the coming of of the Christ child. So it's interesting that today we have these readings for Christ the King. We have two readings I want to focus on. One is Ezekiel and the other one is Matthew. Now Ezekiel, you may remember, we talked about him a while back as this prophet that was sitting by this lake and he had these visions of this throne up on top of this platform and he was watching it float away from Jerusalem over to Babylon. You may remember that. Well, that's because he knows what's about to happen and he's trying to get the people to turn toward God because the exile is about to occur, and of course they don't. The exile happens, and these people are dispersed all over the place. And in the book of Ezekiel, we get to see it happening. Well, our lesson today happens right afterwards. After Jerusalem has been sacked, after the temple has been destroyed, now the people are saying, is God done with us? Is this it? Is it over? Is God done? And Ezekiel is looking at them saying, no, there's hope. That God is going to take care of his sheep, of the pasture. That God is going to restore the people. That there's going to be a new shepherd, a new Messiah. One that we have been waiting for and have not yet received. It's going to come. And when this Messiah comes, our hearts will be transformed. We'll no longer be hardened hearts, but our hearts will be softened by God. And then we will meet this new Messiah. That's to come, and our lives will be restored. So he's looking at these people and saying, there is hope. Don't give up hope. God is not done with us. There is more to come. Now, as we look at the Gospel of Matthew now, Matthew 25 is an interesting reading. It's only found in Matthew. It's not in Mark or Luke or John. So this is the only time that we have this conversation that Jesus is going to have with his disciples and others. Right before this, for the past month, we've been hearing all these parables about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like bridesmaids. It's like slaves with talents. It's like a fig tree. We've listened to all these different parables comparing what the kingdom of heaven is like. And now Jesus is going to bring it on home. And he starts off by saying, when the son of man returns, he's going to be in glory on a throne. And he's going to bring all the nations together. There's some telling things that are happening in that first part. Son of man was a phrase that was used in between the Testaments, between Old Testament and New Testament. Here's your Jeopardy word for the day, intertestimonial. Yeah, that's a good one, right? Yeah. So in between these two time frames, this phrase, this idea, this concept of the Son of Man was really taking hold. And this person, this Messiah, this King that's to come is going to bridge the gap between heaven and earth. Where there will not be able to see any difference between the two of them. The Son of Man is coming. And that means that it's heaven no matter where we are in that sense. So this is something to really look forward to. And so Jesus is saying when the Son of Man comes in all of his glory and he sits on that throne, he's going to call all nations together. Now, I used to read years back Gentiles because it, was, it had been translated to say Gentiles. So it only felt like the Gentiles, the people that weren't Jewish, were going to be called through good and bad sheep and goat kind of a thing but the real true reading of it speaks to all 
all nations here. And he's going to separate them, the sheep from the goats, like a shepherd would she separate sheep from goats. Sheep and goats would be feeding together. They'd be living together. They'd be hanging out together. They're playing poker. You know, they're just they're doing their thing. And then and here comes the Son of Man. And this king, this shepherd, this Messiah figure is going to come and separate them. All the sheep are going to be on his right. And all the goats are going to be on his left. And he's going to look over at these sheep. And he's going to say, bah! No, I'm just kidding. That's a bad joke. Sorry. So he's going to look at these sheep. And he's going to say, you're, you're, you're blessed. The kingdom is yours. Because when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you took care of me. And these sheep are going to be like, yeah, we did. That's awesome. We're pretty good, right? Yeah, Jesus, we did all those things. When? When did we do them? And Jesus is going to look at them and say, when you were doing that to the least of these, you did that to me. When you were helping that baby, when you were tending to that sick person, when you were helping that widow, when you were nice to the, to the marginalized, whenever you welcomed the alien, you were doing that to me. And then he looks over here at the goats, and he's like, ooh, you guys are accursed. You're going to be off into the eternal fire. Now, that's a pretty interesting phrase, the eternal fire. At this time frame, there was a spot outside of Jerusalem called Gehenna. And it was this dump. And you would take your trash to the dump. We take our trash to the curb. They would roll that black cart all the way out to Gehenna, right? And they would dump it into this big dump. And it would be set ablaze. And it would be put on fire. And the trash would then dissipate out into ash, right? So people all the time were taking their trash out to this dump. You didn't leave it at home. You took your trash out to the dump. So much so that that dump never stopped being on fire in other words, it was an eternal flame, an eternal fire. These accursed are going to go to the eternal fire, Jesus is saying. Because when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, when I was naked, when I was in prison, when I was sick. And the goats are like, what? what? When? I mean, I didn't see you. I don't know what you're talking about. We weren't trying to harm you, Jesus. We weren't doing it on purpose. I promise, I promise, I promise. But Jesus like, when you did it to the least of these, when you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And you're going to be in the eternal fire. Now, it'd be really easy to read this as in like, there are some people that are perfectly good and some people that are perfectly bad. And I don't think that's what's happening here. It's like all of a sudden the people over here are the sheep. You're going to have to move. And, <laughs> and all the people over here are the goats, and I have no clue what to do with the choir. All right? <laughs> so here we have all these people over here that every time somebody was hungry, you fed them. Every time somebody was thirsty, you gave them something to drink. Every time somebody was in prison, you visited every single person in prison. You took care of every single person that was ever sick. What's wrong with y'all, huh? It's not like we haven't done those things. Not a single one of us has done this perfect. I don't think Jesus is talking about us as individual good or bad types of people. And I'll give you the best example of this, okay? How many of y'all celebrated Thanksgiving this past week? Just a show of hands. How many of y'all were surrounded by family members this past week? How many of y'all thought bad things about those family members? Put your hands down. <laughs> I got family members here right now, right? Yeah. We all think, we say, we do things that are so-called unbecoming, that are things that we are not proud of, that belong in that so-called <laughs> goat category, if you will. We do those things. None of us are perfect. But what the lessons are telling me today is that this God has the ability to transform our hard hearts and soften them, that can separate the righteous from the unrighteous when that time comes, and those unrighteous things that are in us are burnt away and the righteous inherit this kingdom yesterday around three o'clock i was in this sanctuary practicing my sermon as i do i say some pretty wild things around that time frame nobody's in here the doors are locked and all of a sudden a woman appears through that doorway and says excuse me and I turn and I say, yes. And she says, can you help me? 
And immediately I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this woman's going to need money. She's going to need food. I'm alone. This is terrible. She looks shady. She's got tattoos on her face and, and piercings everywhere. And she's going to want gas or something. And I've got to finish the sermon. And worship's going to be here pretty soon. And I said, how can I help you? And she was like, I'd like some holy water. And now the hair on the back of my neck standing up. And I'm like, holy water, what are we going to do with this? What's going to happen? What kind of ritual are you performing, you know? And I said, sure, but can, can we sit and talk? So she sits down with me, and she starts to tell me her story about for the last three weeks, she's been taking care of herself in ways she never has before, not using things that she has before. She's got a job that she's had for three weeks. She's now in a new home for the past three weeks, and she wants to bless it. And I was like, let's get you that holy water. <laughs> we fill up a couple of jars of water, and I look at her and I say, now, now, I don't believe that I make this holy. God's the one that does it. I'm going to say words, you have this water, and you're going to take God with you into your home to bless your home. And I hope that I see you again. And she says, you will. So I'm excited. Maybe she'll show up at some point in time. Um, but as she left, I got back in here trying to figure out how to end this sermon. And then I thought, just as we do to the least of these, we do to Christ. When we're doing for others, we're doing for Christ. We're not always going to get this right. We're going to mess up. We're going to think things and say things that we don't want to even admit to. We'd never want to even tell our mamas about. But we're called to rise above that at times and to try to do what God's asking us to do. When we're treating others, we're treating Christ. When we're doing for others, we're doing for Christ. What we do for the least of these, we do for Christ. Amen.